Hey, Rockheads, this is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. Here to announce the NDC Sydney Conference, September 17th through 21st. Go to NDCSydney.com to register. Tell them Carl and Richard sent you. Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. Here in our respective abodes. Our little corners of the world. Well, I'm up on the coast still, which seems to be the corner I prefer to be in these days. Yep, you're hanging with the otters. I am hanging with the otters, and uh, the, the seal pups just got weaned, so there were literally crying seals out front of our place, looking for their mamas. Barking. Their mamas have bugged off. Yep. Yeah. They're, they're little, little sea dogs. <laughs> Do you have dolphins up there? There are white-sided dolphins around, but I have not seen any recently. Wow. Neat. We've, uh, I think I mentioned this, we in, in Connecticut, we've had mountain lions. Oh, no, that's not good. You're not mountains. No, and black bears, too. Every once in a while, they sort of wander in. Sort of drop by. Yeah. See, that's my shtick, right? It's the black bear in the garbage can thing. Right. Well, enough chit-chat. Let's roll the Better Know Framework crazy music, TM. Awesome. <laughs> All right, dude, what do you got? This is from Joel, Joel Hewlin, who always comes up with good stuff. Joel of the man. Yeah, it's Pulumi, which I know kind of sounds like a cheese with a plosive on the front of it. Nice. (laughs) Pulumi. Pulumi is sort of evidence that we've run out of single vowel combinations for products. (laughs) So now we do multi-vowel combinations. I know. the, the, The best words get made up when people are surfing for domain names. That's it. You know? All right. Well, it's Pulumi, P-U-L-U-M-I dot com. It's a company that just publicly announced last month, and it's founded by several Microsoft people. Hmm. So they provide a cloud-native programming model for provisioning services and all that. But here's the thing. They use real programming languages as opposed to Terraform. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, it's for developers, by developers kind of thing. Oh, I know about this company. This is Luke Hoban, who's... uh one of the geniuses behind C Sharp and, mm. uh, you know, the serious guy. And, and Joe Duffy, Eric Rudder, like, eh, you're talking some big gun Microsoft serious folks. Serious big are, gun guys, yeah. No question. We should get them on the show, I think. I think that's a show in the making. That seems like a good idea. Yep. All right. Who's talking to us today, Richard? Uh, I would have pulled a comment from Gabe's last show, which was in March of 2010, episode 534. But wow. I don't even know if we had a comment engine back then, so they can't do that. But I know we're going to talk a little bit about code security. And recently, just August of last year, we talked to Barry Dorans about yes. security in ASP.NET Core. It's yep. 1470, my favorite drop bear, Barry Dorans. And uh, he's actually he had a bunch of great comments, at, uh, many of which I've read. This one is from Rasmus, who says, this was a great show. I moved it to the top of my queue as soon as I saw ASP.NET Core, and I wasn't disappointed. Mm-hmm. I would love more shows with Barry and hear more about the pros and cons of different identity, authentication, and et cetera, frameworks. I don't know if I can handle that much snark, you know, there's Ah. like a snark threshold. (laughs) Snark with an Irish accent, it's great. Yeah, Barry's like a semi-annual snark dosage you can take (laughs) on, right? That's that's about what you can do. A brilliant semi-annual snark dosage. Yes. No, no, you're definitely educated. You just coded in snark in the process. It's like, is that snark on my shoes? What is that? Uh Rasmus goes on to say, I had just used Entity Framework's core from SQL method earlier today because I needed some special sorting of the query output. Even though I did use SQL parameter, I'm now rethinking how to do it so I don't bring down the wrath of Barry. Because <laughs> let's be clear, you want to sanitize your inputs mm-hmm. from your users before you go stuffing them into SQL queries. Or anywhere else. Really sanitize all your inputs. Bobby Tables is yeah, out there. That's and right. He wants you. Little Bobby Tables doesn't want to get dropped. That's it. Little Bobby Tables is watching for you. And uh, oddly enough, Barry uh, responded to that message where he said, You're on my list now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Rasmus, I can't save you from the wrath of Barry, but I can get you a copy of Music to Code By. And so a copy of Music to Code By is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music to Code By, write a comment on the website at dotnetrocks.com or via any of our social media because we publish every show Facebook and Google. Plus. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music to Code By. And definitely follow us on Twitter. He's at Rich Campbell. I'm at Carl Franklin. Send us a tweet. We terraform them for your protection. 
<laughs> See, now let me explain why that's funny because I would have said sanitize for your protection because yes. that's the joke, really. But that's, that's what you're expecting. Joke. And then all of a sudden, boom, terraform. There you are with a terraform. And of course, we're doing a little too meaning thing because it could have been a cloud terraform. It could or have, it could have smacked a comment into your head. It, right? It's funny on <laughs> so many levels, Gabe can barely stand it. <laughs> well, some, on one of those levels, I'm laughing. I would have used to obfuscate personally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yes. oh, we obfuscate for your protection. Of course you would. That's actually <laughs> would. would have been really smart, but uh, yep. I didn't. I didn't go there. So let me just formally introduce Gabe Torak. As Richard said, he was last on the show in 2010. Uh, he's principal and CEO of Preemptive Solutions, and he's got significant experience in application hardening and software development. He's hard and soft, kids. His company, <laughs> Preemptive Solutions, has had its .fuscator product inside Microsoft's Visual Studio.net since 2003. Yep. Yes. It's a long Pretty sure time. he was first in the box, and he was the last out of the box, or rather, the box left. Yeah. There, was, there is <laughs> no right. box. There is no box. That's right. I still have a signed copy of the box from 2002. Oh, I do too. Uh, yeah. I love it. Yeah. That's worth mm. at least ten dollars. <laughs> Maybe fifteen. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm thinking I can get fifteen for it. <laughs> but I mean, if we go back to the day, and of course I'm working on the flipping book, so I care about the day. The whole obfuscation thing was a big deal in 2002. Yeah, like, it was. we were really, you know, for whatever reason, people were really freaking about about reverse engineering code, and then it's that because was a they hard coded their passwords in their code. <laughs> Who would do that? Nobody does that. Uh, they, well, oh, people oh, used to do that all the time. People still do that. Are you kidding? Yeah, they still do. Yeah. They do. Yeah. And then they publish it to GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> with, it, with it still uh, in the clear. <laughs> yeah. We laugh because we're all in pain. <laughs> <sighs> oh, don't oh, worry. Man. It's a private repo. Hey, guess what? We're going public three years later. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's actually really cool. The I get a report, of course, before, because of Humanitarian Toolbox. I get a report every week from GitHub on potential security vulnerabilities in the code of the different uh, HD Box projects. I kind of think Phil Hack might have or may not have had something to do with that. Yeah, but it's just such an intelligent <laughs> thing for a repository like that with so much code, yeah. and so much awareness of the vulnerabilities out there to just say, hey. This sure looks like a password. Mm. You, you might want to do something about that. Might want to salt and that. Maybe yeah, throw it, some hash on it. Yeah. Yeah. Have you yeah. ever thought about storing it in a key vault not in your source code? There's an idea. That would be a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Gabe, we're a little punchy today. Oh, I see that. Yeah. Good. You came on the road trip with us in 2010? 2010, yeah. Yeah. It seems like forever ago, but Yes. Yes, that was uh, well. It was it was eight years ago. That is forever ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It but was you, a lot of. Fun. You were on the trip where we were doing the ride along with Carl and Richard. Where yes, we'd, son, we'd, we'd quote pick a winner, right? To come with it, you know, and the win is the relative concept. It's like you're going to come on the RV with us, <laughs> yeah. and we're going to draw. You know, we get to the next spot, and then we're going to fly you back or train you back or i think at one point a wife came and drove him back <laughs> but there, there were several times i had to convince the spouse don't worry we're, we're we will return him with all the big parts still attached like we it's uh, gonna be okay. we made some good friends that way though you did oh absolutely Half to this Thor day. turned out to be a really good friend yeah for sure just reminiscing a little bit with our friend gabe but what are you doing these days gabe uh, well, before I say that, I, I do remember that your uh, your winners were not random. It, it seemed like if people brought whiskey, they were much more likely to win. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, he, okay, he had, it was a tricky <laughs> list to pick from because there's only so many folks that can actually just spontaneously take a day off. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Yeah, but it's the .NET Rocks guys. No, I remember that phone call. I remember somebody. That's right. We begging had to at prove it. Giving another, yeah. Something oh, you guys like had that. people stalking you and following you on the highway. I mean, it's crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. That's right. That was a we lot did. Of fun. Yeah. Huh. We didn't want to find car accidents because they were trying to keep up with the RV. Not that we would drive right. the RV quickly, because you know we're safe and conscientious drivers. Well, you couldn't drive that thing quickly. It was rattling so badly once you got over a certain speed. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, but if you got up fine high enough over that speed, you were simply vibrated off the road and you were good. <laughs> we did have a GPS tracker on us. So there's a few times people sending messages going, is this actually correct? Because I didn't think an RV went quite that fast. <laughs> Are we going to ever talk yes, about code yes, security exactly. on this podcast? <laughs> let's let's do it. So what's new? So, so uh, as you brought up a good point, back in 2003, Microsoft uh, asked us to put a, a light version of our product in the box because... They had a lot of people that didn't want to move to .NET because they right. were used to things like VB and native code that were more difficult to reverse engineer, and and they didn't want people to you know get their IP and see their source code. Uh, what's really changed since then is that you know all that stuff is still important, but it's 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 important for different reasons, and it's also sort of added on a new level to it. So uh, the new level is is hardening. So it's not just obfuscation, but we're, we do a lot of other things. And obfuscation is used for lots of different reasons and has a lot of different transforms that kind of all work together to give you sort of layered protection. And before you move on, I think the term needs to be defined because those of us who were there in the beginning, well, we sort of have a literary knowledge of what to obfuscate is to sort of hide the truth. But obfuscating code means just sort of scrambling it, right? Well. If you think about .NET, you can very easily take a tool, like a free reverse engineering tool, .NET Peak, IL Spy, you know, there's a bunch of them out there. IL DASM was one of the first ones. Exactly. And, and, and with these tools, you can pretty much recreate the source code from the executable. Now, you lose the comments and maybe the names of some of the local variables, but otherwise, you pretty much have the source code back verbatim from the executable. Yeah. And so the thing is, if somebody wants to bypass your license checks, if somebody wants to look for vulnerabilities, let's say they they let's say you were stupid and you had coded your passwords, uh, you know, in, in the string. Well, boom, it's right there in front of them. Mm -hmm. um, but also other vulnerabilities, uh, you know, they, they could they could literally take one of these static checking tools, take your source code, and run it on there and look for vulnerabilities that maybe you didn't catch. Mm. Uh, sure. So ha having the source code is a great blueprint for a hacker. It's kind of like you know, here it is. Go look, go look for 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 flaws. Now, if it's open source, supposedly you've got a team of people that are kind of scouring it, and you're getting your notifications and all that. But if it's closed source, you you, you don't necessarily have that. Mm. Um, so the other, but the other part of so obfuscation is is making it's it's renaming all the symbols. It's uh, changing the control flow structure so that it it doesn't necessarily uh, translate back into source code. It's perfectly yeah. legal intermediate language, but you can't bring it back to source code. It just creates like this gibberish mess if it doesn't right. crash the decompiler. And you can't tell what's going on by looking at. It. It's certainly not readable. It's not readable, and uh, um, we encrypt the strings. We, you know, we do a whole bunch of stuff uh, to make that really hard for a hacker to figure out. Not impossible, you know. The, the thing I always tell people, and this is a argument I sometimes hear as well. You know, obfuscation is not a hundred percent perfect, so why use it? And I say to people, was well, locking your house a hundred percent perfect? Right. No, they could break you know? the windows. They could move to a higher level of crime. But at what cost if they right. get, you're, you're upping the risk. And you're upping the time. So. Always the argument is, if they weren't lazy, they wouldn't be thieves. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, at some point it's like, this is enough work, we could just do it ourselves. Right. So we want to stop the, the 95% uh, and then make it really hard for the, the re remaining, but not impossible. Because uh, you can't make anything in security impossible. All you can do is make it difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the whole hardening piece, which is really where we've been focusing our energy on lately, is really more about not just protecting the code, but protecting the data that the code accesses. Right. So when you think about, you know, we have a lot of like mobile banking clients now that, you know, honestly really don't care that much about protecting the code, except maybe to make sure you can't find vulnerabilities. But they really care about uh, making sure, for example, the app isn't running on a rooted device. Because if the app's running on a rooted device, that means all the security protection around spying on the app is gone. So you could watch the yeah. internet traffic going back and forth and, and do things like that. So there's a lot of uh, regulations now, you know, uh, PCI uh, regulations, uh, NIST, 
Um, OWASP is a, is a regulatory body that talks about security that, that basically says you mm -hmm. should never let your apps run on a, a rooted or a compromised device. Mm -hmm. uh, because if it, they're accessing sensitive data. So leave it up to the application to decide whether or not the machine is exploited? Oh, so we can detect that. Um, we have a, a whole cool. ser series of algorithms that we can inject into your application that make it not run on a rooted device or yeah. allow you to make it not run correctly on a rooted device. So we've had mm -hmm. some people that... Uh, if it, the device is rooted, it will connect to a test database instead of the real database, for example. Huh. <laughs> that that ought to be a fun surprise. Yeah, which is like, okay, you know. Um, uh, so, so there's a lot of interesting things you can do to detect if an app was tampered with, uh, to detect if it's running on a compromised device. Going back to an interview you just had with James uh, Montemagno, I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, yeah, so correct, I met yeah. James several times and uh, a great guy. We, we, we do a lot with Xamarin and uh, he talked about emulators. Well, yeah. emulators are great, right, for your writing code testing, but you got to also look at the tools and how hackers think and what they'll do. So their tools of choice are things like emulators, debuggers, those kind of things, because they want to step through your code. They want to see it accessing the data. They want to step over instructions, you know, do, do those kind of things. So we can, we can inject into your Xamarin applications the ability to detect if it's running on a, a rooted device. Uh, and that's really important because a lot of people do root their, say, their Android phones um, because it's kind of easy. It avoids the warranty, but a lot of people like to, to do, especially developers, right? They exactly. love to do that. Right. But now what happens is if it's a, if it's a financial app, and someone's running it on a rooted device. Well, now one app can spy on another app. All the sure. all the security. So, so the financial institution might make a decision. Hey, I'm not going to let you run my app on a rooted device because the the things I count on to help protect, you know, our data and and quite frankly, you, uh, yeah. uh, you know, depend on the the device not being rooted. Mm -hmm. If you just connect a regular Android phone to your machine, let's say to your Windows machine, you can browse all of the file structure. Are you actually able to get to Xamarin assemblies and then pull them over to your machine and, and IL DASM them and see what they're doing? Yeah, you can actually decompile without our stuff, obfuscating and hardening uh, your Xamarin applications. You could actually decompile the code because remember, it's being run inside of a framework uh, that's very mono like. Right, mm. um, uh, you could get to all that stuff just like you could on a, on a .NET app. So that's interesting. Just because you're running on a phone doesn't mean people can't look at your code and see what you're doing. That's right. So don't hard code those passwords in there, kids. <laughs> you should never do that anyway. That's like, <laughs> <laughs> no. please, please, please. <laughs> I feel like a hundred oh. million people just rolled their eyes at oh, me. God, just yes, like, come Dad. on, tell us something we don't know. But I'll tell you, we see, you know, we talk to a lot of customers. We see that all the time still. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah. Well, I, I, I presume it's the usual thing. I just need to get this working first. Then we'll lock it down. And you never seem to get around to the lockdown phase. Yeah. That, that's, that's it a lot of times. That is yeah. very true. And just to be clear here, you know, you have a community edition and a, and a professional edition. I know there's no box anymore for you to be in. But folks can still download the community edition and you have... You know, well, the, we still we still ship as part of Visual Studio. So even okay. it's, even though technically it's not in a quote unquote box, when you download right. Visual Studio, uh, 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 now now Visual Studio is different than it used to be. So Visual Studio used to be mm -hmm. this big monolithic thing, right? So you got Visual Studio, yep. you got everything Visual Studio had, whether you were building Xamarin apps or you know web apps or whatever, you got the whole thing, the whole enchilada. And so we mm -hmm. were on the tools menu by default, always there. And, and so now Visual Studio is, is, you know, asks you what kind of apps you're building and installs what it thinks you'll need and makes recommendations, but still allows you to install everything. So if you're installing a .NET client app, for example, we'll be on the recommended list and yeah. we're always available. So if you install Visual Studio, all you got to do is go find Obfuscator on their list, not us, right? It's all inside Visual Studio. Mm. Just make sure it's installed. Right. Yeah. 
just like everything else in Visual Studio, right? It's all it's so we're, And we're back to that same old concept that's like, you already own this, whether you know it or not, if you're using Studio. Exactly. So when I think of a security tool that has a community edition, I wonder, okay, where's the... Where's the back door? Is, it, is that what? <laughs> what? So tell me. That would be just, awful. Just, Are you kidding? I know. I know. It's <laughs> crazy, but that's where my mind goes. So tell us, uh, reassure us that the community edition is going to make your code just as secure as the professional edition. Well, it won't. That's why it's the community edition. I mean, okay. <laughs> well, it's going to make it secure, but let's talk about it, the differences. It'll Maybe do the things it that. does. Uh, correctly. How's that? Um, yeah, yeah. So, so the community edition is basically does. Uh, the renaming part of obfuscation. So if you want to make sure that your symbol names aren't readable, you know, you have method A that calls A that returns A or some in- unprintable character, uh, it'll do all of that just the same as the professional edition will. Uh, okay. What it won't do uh, uh, is, you know, the control flow obfuscation, the string encryption, some of the anti technologies I'm talking about, the anti-debug, the anti-tamper, the anti-root device, you, you know, this whole layer of hardening your app. Got it. Uh, it does some of that because, you know, we want, you know, we want the community edition to be useful and valuable. Sure, so sure. if you're building a Xamarin app, you can uh, uh, use the community edition and detect if the app is rooted yeah. uh, and respond to it and notify uh, you know, some place that you already go see notifications that, you know, apps are running on in a rooted scenario mm-hmm. in this situation. Um, yeah. So, so what we're really trying to do with the community edition is, you know, get it out there, get people using it. But then if you want sort of that full level of protection, then you, you upgrade to the, the pro version. It's, it's right. not unlike, you know, models that Microsoft uses. No, uh, sure. Everybody else. And it's, uh, you know, the community edition is enough to get to know what it does and that you can trust it. So, hey, hold that thought right there, Gabe, while we take a moment for this very important message. Hi, this is Richard. The Dev Intersection Fall Show this year will be December 3rd to 6th in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand Hotel. The lineup is awesome. Scott Guthrie, Scott Hanselman, Scott Hunter, yes, all the Scots. But also a ton of great industry speakers for some insight on what's coming up in the world of .NET. You know, Core 3 is bringing client technology like WinForms and WPF into play. Could it be time to migrate your existing desktop apps to this new technology? Come learn more at Dev Intersection, December 3rd to 6th in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand. Go to devintersection.com to register and use the code .NET Rocks to get a discount. All right, we're back. It's .NET Rocks. Carl Franklin here, Richard Campbell there, and Gabe Tarok over there. And where is over there? Where is over there? Cleveland, yeah. Ohio. That's right. I, that's the yeah. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's when you said there was a stalker on the road trip. <laughs> that's where he was. That's where he was. That's where he ran <laughs> yeah. into us. That's where he that's caught right. us. That's right. That's yeah. right. I was there. I wasn't the yeah, stalker, yeah. but I was there. No, no, no. You were welcome. <laughs> You're a welcome stalker. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, that was the time, without doubt. So, uh, have we exhausted what's in the professional edition? I mean, you sort of went through this list of things, and the the anti rooting thing is huge for me. If I, w- I wouldn't, I wouldn't install a public app on an Android phone or another phone without knowing that. That's huge. That that is huge. We we've you know what's what's really interesting about it is that uh, you're now starting to get into uh, compliance issues. Um, there's mm-hmm. there's a lot of uh, um, different compliance things out there, right? I could get into you know GDPR, PCI, all these things, and they all talk about protecting the data that the applications touch. And so, when you think about hardening an app, you think about what are the different ways. Think like a hacker would. So, how would a hacker uh, attack an application? And, and and they're attacking applications now because it's much harder to attack. Uh, through firewalls and through networks mm. now, right? Those those web application firewalls, quite honestly, are pretty good now. Um, yeah. So they they have to get sneakier. They they have to they come at you from a different way. So they're looking for vulnerabilities, and applications mm-hmm. are uh, uh, are an easier target now. They weren't before, but they are now yeah. uh, because the firewalls have gotten so good. And so. If you think about a hacker, they're going to use uh, tools like debuggers, and they're going to step through your app. They're going to see how it communicates with your server. Uh, they're going to look for for uh, things that you haven't thought of through that process. And so, what we want to do is make the app very um, 
much more resilient to those types of people. We don't want them running your app in a debugger. There's no good reason to let someone run your app in a debugger. Uh, that's not sure. you, right? Yeah. Um, or an emulator or uh, tampering with your app. You know, tampering, you know, a lot of people think of tampering in the, in the classic sense of sort of bypassing a license check. Right. right. And, we, and we've seen that before. So if you're not using a license check, then why do I care? But it's, that's not the only thing. Right. That's not the only thing. I mean, the cl- uh, one example, I remember this from years ago, is we had a game developer that used our stuff and they put tamper in it. And what they did, I thought this was pretty clever. What, what hackers do is they'll, they'll hack a game and then, and then you know, thump their chest and release a, the cracked version out on the internet. And so in this case, it was a .NET game. And, but what the, what the anti-tamper uh, did is it didn't respond right away. What it did is it made the door from level four to level five not appear. So now the the hacker thought the game was cracked. He released it. So mean. And people started playing it, but they could only play it so far and then get frustrated, right? That's brilliant. (laughs) Yeah. You get them invested in it and enjoying it, and it's like, yeah, you can't go any further. Exactly. Yeah. And the hacker doesn't play it all the way through. He just cracks it and then thumps his chest and releases it. He plays it maybe one level and says, okay, it works, you know. Um, yeah. we've seen other people, uh, with tamper, uh, make the app run in a degraded mode. Um, we've, uh, we've seen people that have apps that access, uh, they don't have licensing in them, but they access functionality. So these are things like, uh, there was one customer. I remember that the application they had, uh, changed the horsepower characteristics of turbochargers in, in engines. Huh. And they charged for huh. that. So literally, you could buy the engine with a certain horsepower curve, and then the mechanic, you could pay the mechanic, and he would change the horsepower characteristics of your car to give you more horsepower. And they had mechanics that started to crack the app so that they could not pay, you know, do it for free. Right. So right. they protected it against that because the app gated functionality. Pretty cool. So we've seen all, just all kinds of crazy stuff that, that people uh, you know, have done and, and, and need our stuff for. But a lot of the area that we're focusing on right now is around um, you know, hardening the app to protect the data that the application's touching. And that's hitting a lot of compliance and regulatory things. And we're also doing a lot of work around making the app uh, possible to run in the cloud very easily. So if you want to run it inside uh, your build process inside Azure, for example, mm. um, you know that's going to be a really easy model to do. We're, we're doing a lot of uh, uh, ease of use now. We're redoing the way that we integrate with Visual Studio to, to make it you know, really easy to configure and kind of streamlined. When you say protect the data that the app touches, you're really talking about server side? I'm really talking about protecting. Uh, so if you think about our stuff in general, the way I think about it is uh, the, for our stuff to be valuable, the app has to be running in an untrusted environment. And yeah. untrusted is not up to us. It's up to the customer. So I've had, believe it or not, I, I've had customers I talk to and it's internal only app. And I say, why are you obfuscating and hardening this? It's only running internally. And they said, yeah, but we're a global organization. So we're running this in f- other countries. And it's by contractors. And quite honestly, we have a low level of trust there. Wow. Right. Well, and you might even have circumstances where governments are hacking that software. For, uh, absolutely. For surveillance Shh, they purposes. don't do that. <laughs> so <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> so trust is in the eye of the beholder. Let's put it that way. Uh, sure. And then, and then the other thing is, does the app contain a uh, valuable IP? Have you done something interesting and novel? Mm. Uh, does the app access uh, gated functionality? So if somebody were to bypass it, they could get to something they would have had to pay for. Yeah. Uh, does mm. the app touch sensitive data? Are there regulations, HIPAA, you know, things around the, that? And then, sure. and then, so if you can answer yes to those questions, then how are you hardening that app? so that a hacker couldn't use that as the attack vector to get to the data. Yeah, right. And so this is this sort of reflexive, any data that I'm handling that's potentially sensitive is always encrypted, right, up until it's stored or displayed? Well, data, I mean, data should be encrypted, right, in, in, mm-hmm. in transit, at Even rest. Even when it's stored. At rest. The, the tricky part of data, and here's, here's kind of the, the tough part, is in use, it's not encrypted. 
right? So in transit, right. at rest, obviously you can encrypt the data, but in use is tough because you have to decrypt it to use it. Mm -hmm. Do you remember, Richard, the guy who um, had a in-memory attack uh, tool that we uh, interviewed? And at the end of the day, he was basically giving away the tool to do the hacking for free and then right. selling so the would... tool to protect yourself against his <laughs> hacking tool. The whole oh, thing was really just creepy, our wasn't stomach. it? Yeah, and it kind of felt, I'm, maybe we shouldn't have published that show, but it, yeah, it came across super creepy. Wow, I wonder if he ever got any takers. Yeah, that's so, a good question. So, to your point, in-memory hacking is perhaps the easiest because right. memory is just, it has to be. It has to be there, right? It has to it has be in the be clear there. at some point. Now, th there's things you can do. And so using our software helps that because we won't let a debugger run. So in memory use, a lot of times the easiest way is just fire up a debugger and look mm, at the memory, sure. right? Because yeah. it's not decrypted the whole time. You've got to step through a certain number of instructions and get to just the right point and all of that, right? Well, if the debugger doesn't run, okay, now, okay, this doesn't work. Now I got to get a lot more sophisticated in how I'm going to do this. Well, uh, I know there's more to that story, but uh, let's hang on a minute because, Richard, you know what time it is now? It's time for a really awkward segue. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to run the mid-show joke in HD. That's a Ooh. humor debugger. Oh, so, okay. Let's press F5 and, hey, it runs. No exceptions. Uh, Oh, wait, this is the community edition. You have to get the <laughs> professional edition to detect that's actually not funny. <laughs> Damn. Do you guys make this stuff up on the fly? This is pretty good. <laughs> he writes it on the fly. He really, you know, I tease my friend mercilessly, but you know, he writes, he writes a joke in the first half of the show every single time usually 10 some, minutes before i tell it but that's yeah uh, if you know if you're really into listening to the show and i'm giving away a secret here you'll find that often i'm carrying the conversation right before this break and it's because he's finishing a joke <laughs> and then sometimes you never people never hear this but sometimes right after the break i ask a question that richard just asked while i was writing the joke and richard yeah, said he was focused uh, on something else like, i just asked dude. that buddy yeah we went there <laughs> oh yeah. that's an edit point <laughs> yeah, we'll fix that up. So there you go. A little in insight into how the shows work. But nope, he wrote that on the fly. And that's pretty damn. That was a funny one, dude. Love it. <laughs> well, all right. Actually, it's time to give away a $200 Amazon gift card, compliments of progress Telerik, to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. But first, let me tell you about the most comprehensive developer toolkit for building modern apps on the market today, Telerik DevCraft. With more than 1,100 Telerik.net and Kendo UI JavaScript components and controls, you can easily build modern, high-performant web, mobile, and desktop apps, as well as chatbots. The toolset also includes reporting solutions, automated testing and productivity tools, and comes with a range of support options. New this year is a free online training program for all license holders. And with this, alongside thousands of demos with source code, comprehensive docs, and a full assortment of Visual Studio templates, you'll be up and running with the Progress Telerik and Kendo UI tools in no time. Download a free 30-day trial right now at Telerik.com slash download. Well, all right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner is Nadine Waslo. Oh, congratulations, Nadine. Yeah. Golf clap for Nadine, you. Did you get them a bottle of whiskey? That's what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> no whiskey was transferred in selecting a winner. I may or may not be telling the truth. <laughs> Nadine just won a $200 Amazon gift card. Compliments of Progress Telerik just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you'd like to be a member of the fan club, go to .NET Rocks .com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, Answer a few questions and join the club. We have thousands of members all over the world. In every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors. And every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of the fan club. But you have to sign up to win. All right, Gabe, it's your turn. If you had $5,000 to spend on technology right now, what would you buy? Right now, I would probably get one of those fancy, really fast electric bikes. Because I just think they're oh. really cool. The scooters? Uh, yeah. Oh, well, electric motorcycle. scooters. Uh, electric, yeah. But it's, uh, uh, yeah, those. 
uh, it's it's not a bike per se, right? Well, there's, have there's ones that there's ones that are like they they look like a bike. You they do have pedals. It looks like a bicycle. They go, they go yeah. like twenty eight miles an hour, and you can pedal yeah, yeah. if you want, but you don't. An have. electro moped. Yeah, sort of. Yes, sort of along those lines. Yeah, but it's very hmm. very much. There's there's some very stylish ones right now. I think Casey Neistat is riding one of the cool ones. But yeah, I know what you're talking about, and they yeah, there's some pretty neat ones. Yeah, so basically you can ride up hills as easy as riding down a hill, you know. Yeah. Hmm. And they some of them go wicked fast, which hmm, you know, hmm, is a little hmm. scary, but it just that looks yeah. really fun. And for five grand, you're talking a serious oh, oh, electric yeah. bike. Like, right. That's a that's, beast. That's like the creme de la creme. Yeah. It, that's gonna leave a mark. <laughs> that's what that is. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Ouch. Yeah, very cool. That's a good idea. Yeah. Very uh, ecologically sound. There you go. I, I want to talk some more about in-memory debugging and in-memory hacking and uh, what some of the things are that you guys do to protect our apps. Okay, excellent. So some of the things you can do, like I mentioned, the first thing you can do is make sure that they can't run it in a debugger because that's probably the tool they're going to use because they need to step through a certain instruction set to get to the point where the memory gets decrypted. What about hardware debuggers? Do they even make those anymore? Oh, wow. Oh, I'm sure they do, but I haven't seen them. I haven't... Do you remember those things? The, I, like, had soft I, had ice? A, I had a periscope board back in yeah. the day. Right. But, but dude, that's like Windows 3.1 era. That's old yeah. school. I know, but I mean, they, they must exist still. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Okay, well, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> uh, you're right. Probably the, the really probably not important. Uh, you know, government type hackers have those kind of things for sure, I would imagine. And it was basically a way to dump memory into a separate copy of memory on a different piece of hardware. Right. You know, regardless of the state of the operating system, literally just snapshot RAM. Mm. So then you could poke through it, which that's got to be stunningly hard to defeat, but... That's not the average thing. Well, is you know, there a way? I mean, uh, processes are protected. I don't know if there's a way that you can just take a snapshot of a process that isn't yours and dump the memory somewhere. Yeah. I don't I, know. I, I, I'm sure there are ways to do it. But, uh, but you know, you've got to get to a more sophisticated level of person to be able to do that. And, and there's yeah. things you can do. So first of all, you know, a general guidance I give people is don't, uh, keep things in memory longer than you need to if it's something sensitive, right? right. Decrypt it, use it, and then throw it away. Um, there's uh, crypto strings too, right? There's Microsoft's, there's an API secure string. Yeah. Uh, the problem with that is it's not as useful as you would think. It's it's mainly set up for sort of passwordy kind of things, but it, it's not really useful in the general sense of how you think about things. Hmm. At least I found that to be the case. Uh, it's good for, for certain things like a, maybe a password, um, but you can't really use it in the general case. Otherwise, you could just make all your strings secure strings. But the problem is, is that as soon as you want to manipulate it, it converts yeah. it into a string. And then you kind of right. lost the whole point of using it as a secure string, right? How, now, I don't want to give away any secrets here, but are you basically, like, how do you know when somebody's in a debugger? Is it just because it's certain software or is there particular behaviors? Y yes, there's behaviors. Uh, okay. So there's, there's a there's a whole series of algorithms you can you can detect that you know hey with a really high degree of probability and I'm talking you know pretty much certainty this is running in the debugger and it's not just one thing you're checking for you're checking right. for yeah. things in conjunction together and, and you don't also you, you don't just check for that in one place you check for that in lots of different places and you interlock things right. you, you know you make it difficult to sort of find and pull out. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And any challenging concept. And I noticed you talk a lot about the rooting of Android, but not the rooting of iOS. Yes. Uh, so, you know, here's the thing. We know how to detect jailbroken devices. We've done it. Right. Uh, what we've seen from the market is that the vast majority of rooted devices are Android devices, not iOS devices. Uh, Apple hmm. has made jailbreaking a phone a moving target and and more and more difficult to do. So it, it's pretty hard to jailbreak your phone now. And even if you do jailbreak it, uh, uh, you can, you know it, they break it again. Um, right. 
So we just haven't seen that much customer demand for the jailbroken side as we have mm. the rooted side. Because mm. uh, sure. there's a lot, no, of, a lot of rooted Android phones out there. Yeah. It's a way of life for many yeah. people. Yeah, it is. Because they want to get apps and not pay for them. There's a whole ecosystem there. Of, so you know. I recently <laughs> was considering rooting my, one of my phones. And here's why. Turns out Android has a real problem with resolving local IP addresses on a LAN. If there's no, you know, DNS server, if you're using, you know, a NAT router that has DHCP built in and any client, any computer client that connects to it can use names and resolve those names of those computers. But an Android phone connected to Wi-Fi doesn't do it. Hmm. And it may be a nine out of 10 times or something like that, but it has a real problem doing it. And I believe, uh, from what I read on the internets, so you know it's true, it's by design, but um, basically I, what I wanted to do was edit the hosts file in an Android phone. And yes, there's a hosts file that has, hmm. uh, you can put in your own, you know, IP addresses and the names that resolve to. In order to do that, you have to run a hosts file editor. In order to do that, you have to have super user access in order to do that, you have to root your phone. Mm, and right. to root your phone, you're breaking all your warranty and your and things may not run as Gabe was just saying, there's you know, apps that may not run at all if they're rooted. You probably won't get any support from AT and T or your carrier or your um you know, or the phone OS maker, let's say it's Samsung, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the you run the risk of completely destroying your phone just to you know and i had to weigh the consequences and name. i said no nah, yeah. i'm not going to do that <laughs> right it's right. a little bit much so i did get around it in a novel way though i actually made a dns entry on one of my domains like pwop.com that resolved to a nat local ip address and that works just fine interesting mm -hmm. do it externally yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a good way around it. Well, a lot of people have multiple phones, and so they may, uh, especially if you're a hacker, right? You're not going to have just one phone, and so you'll have some rooted phones, and you know you use those for for the things you're doing, and you'll run emulators, right? And the emulators that hackers run are typically also running as rooted because they want to be able to do things that they want to mm -hmm. do, and so you'll you'll use an emulator and step through through the code and and watch what it's doing and watch it decrypting things. And, uh, you know, those are things we want to stop also. Mm -hmm. mm. And is the best thing just having the app not run or you still go down this path of, I mean, if, I feel like some of the stories you've told about how the apps behave is almost set up to get them to call tech support. Uh, no, you know what I'd do? I'd put up a flashing box that says, your computer has been <laughs> infected with a virus. <laughs> And, <laughs> and, and, no, God. and they won't know if that's a real message or not from of a course not. legitimate source. Uh, They're yes. going to reroute the phone. <laughs> exactly. You, you could do any of those things, right? I mean, you could, yeah. we've had we've had people do all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, you know, uh, we've had people put up messages. We've had people, like I mentioned before, connect to have the app connect to a fake database if it's if it's running in an emulator or rooted. You put up a uh, right. a, a progress bar that says completely destroying your phone please wait <laughs> have it go really slow <laughs> oh, Josh, could you imagine a banking app doing that it would, be, <laughs> it would not be good <laughs> i'm also thinking in terms of not so much fa you know false positives like, like you don't want to terrorize a paying customer exactly yeah yeah that's probably not a good that's not a best practice well in canada you don't <laughs> there you go I mean, how many times have we seen Windows come up and say, this may not be a genuine version of Windows? Mm. Right. right. And it's just because uh, something's expired or it you change some hardware around and you've upset it. You have to go through that activation ritual to make that go away. Yeah. Like, I'd hate to have that happen with my, you know, that somebody's in that kind of scenario and uh, with and they are a paying customer of mine and I, I suddenly pull the plug on them. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it, look, all this stuff too is it, it, it's all about layered defense. So it's not like there's going to be one silver bullet that's going to uh, going to protect you, right? And and mm. as I like to say, look, when it comes to security, uh, y you just don't want to be the slowest one running from the bear, right? Uh, <laughs> 
right? Because because uh, you know you just have your... to outrun the second slowest. Exactly. Guy. There you exactly. go. Exactly. So uh, so uh, and I don't mean I don't you. mean you have to be the second crappiest. <laughs> but but what I'm saying is is that there's certain <laughs> things that are just prudent, uh, you know, good hygiene. Yeah kind of things right so not letting a hacker run your app in an emulator and rooted right to me that feels like good hygiene you know running your app through static application security testing penetration testing using data encryption correctly not storing you know things in the clear uh you know there's a there's a certain layer that is is expected i think at this point and it, and and you you need to make sure that you're doing that and then there's things above that right you can get a lot more sophisticated and but a lot of that depends on your app and the and the risks. So you know, this isn't a one size fits all uh, thing. There's some apps that are re touching really sensitive data, and that have really interesting, clever IP in them, or uh, could, you know have a high value uh, reason to break things. So I'll give you. Uh, I've got. I have a lot of customer stories, and I can't. I have to be careful about uh, sharing some sure. of them. But one of them yeah. involves an app that basically uh, uh, gates access to money, and uh, um, you know their whole point in in this uh, that this app will be attacked because if you attack the app, you can get money uh, uh, um, like out of a machine, and um, th they really want to uh, slow you down. And they have a whole series of layers of defense they put in there, and it's really mm. important because there are real people trying to, to do this. Uh, you know, and you have other people that have, you know, some little free app that they wrote. Well, you know, probably don't even need to protect that, right? <laughs> you know, right. there's not there's not a value to it. And then there's the spectrum sort right. of in between. So it's really about looking at what you're building, uh, what the risks are to the IP, to the data, what regulations frameworks you're under, because some of this stuff is under a regulatory framework. There are regulatory frameworks that say if your app is touching sensitive data, you need to protect the app as well, because the app is an attack vector to the data. So looking at the regulations that might apply and then applying sort of common sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think I would start with that. Yeah, no, totally makes sense. And it, and it is an interesting question. Once you've detected a scenario, decide what am I going to do? Because if you are in a hacking scenario, letting the hacker know immediately that they failed, you know, that you've caught them, makes it easier for them to keep working on hacking at you. Exactly. Yeah. Where if you can waste their time. Exactly. No, I like the, like the three strikes password policy, and then you just keep taking passwords. You just stop checking them. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Because a legit Fail. user Fail. knows, Fail. hey, if you've gotten it wrong three times, you should call for help. Like once you see this message that says call for help. Exactly. You know, then then they'll they'll do that. But the bad guy running a bot will just keep pounding away, having no idea that he, no password is valid. Exactly. And and so you could do the same kind of approach. You could have the uh, application uh, still run, but maybe not uh, run correctly. Not have all of its functionality working. Um, mm -hmm. It could it could uh, at some point pop up a message. Uh, asking the user to re-log in or there's all kinds of things you could do or or it could delete the light. What, what, here's another thing we have uh, things. If there's any kind of license key and the app is is run in an emulator or a debugger uh, in unauthorized, uh, deleting the license key, that's another thing people do. Uh -huh. right. You've got to go back and ask for a license key again. You know, I don't know what happened. Right. Any, but, <laughs> you know, it's, it's doing something to kick them back to tech support so you can have a conversation. Because for a legit customer, that's not a big deal. And for a bad guy, it is. Right. Right. Exactly. No, I think that's very smart. So, Gabe, uh, what are you working on now? What's in your inbox? <laughs> What's in my? <laughs> it's full. Let me tell you, because uh, <laughs> I, I, I know most uh, most people's inboxes are pretty full too. Um, yeah. uh, a lot of the stuff we're working on again is making the 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 hard, you know, continuing to improve our hardening technologies to just keep iterating and making it better and better, and to and to make our uh, the ease of use better and better. So we've got a really cool new way of integrating with Visual Studio. Uh, it, we have this running joke that uh, uh, our marketing executive is going to be able to use our product with his hands tied behind his back uh, and blindfolded. Nice. And, and so we're going to, we're making a, a video of this. So uh, I'm curious to see how well it works out. But, but the, the point is where we want to make it really easy to get people going with a sort of a, a, a good level of protection right out of the gate without doing much configuration and just, just getting it, getting it out there. 
And so this should just be part of your, your CI, CD pipeline, right? How you yeah. build software should include this step. Exactly. And you already own it. You already own it. It's in, it's in visuals. And as a matter of fact, there's a build task out there uh, uh, right now on VSTS. Uh, if mm -hmm. you, uh, or whatever it will be renamed to uh, in the future, but um, uh, you can go out there and, uh, and use it right now if you're building it in Azure. It's, it's available. Sure. It works great. Awesome. awesome. For the community edition, 100% free. Fantastic. And I hear the community edition is funnier than the professional edition. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> <laughs> it's got a big nose. <laughs> fuzzy, <laughs> fuzzy mustache. That's right. That's right. If you want to, if you want to look nice and chic and, and trimmed, you have to pay money. Uh, is that the <laughs> <laughs> I guess. But we do goofball for free. <laughs> Gabe, thanks so much. It's been oh. a pleasure having you on the show and talking to you. It's We're old friends, and it probably shows. Yes, it does. Thank you, guys. I really, really appreciate it. And next time you're getting the RV out, give me a call. I'm. Uh, oh, you know we will. I'm ready for you. We'll dust it off if they want <laughs> yeah. us to come out again. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Gabe. Thanks again. Thanks, guys. And thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and of course in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a